Hey guys, I'm Dan from Shasta Bubba Adventures, and today I'm going to be making a little different video than what I've made before. You see, I've decided to combine my passion for backpacking with my day job, which is that I am a mental health counselor, and I've been working for over 20 years in treating the areas of anxiety, depression, and chronic pain. Now, I become aware over time, through reading forums and comments on some of my videos, that one of the biggest obstacles to preventing people from truly enjoying their outdoor experiences is anxiety. In fact, sometimes the fear of what might happen can be so great that people aren't willing to venture out into the woods at all. So, since my channel is all about helping people to learn to increase their enjoyment of their wilderness experiences and adventures, I thought it would be fun and appropriate for me to spend a little time just to talk about some basic concepts of anxiety and to teach some techniques to help people to overcome their fears and learn how to not be afraid in the woods. By the way, I am on a hike in Glacier National Park. This is the trail to Firebrand Pass. It's right on the very southern edge of the park. And this thing behind me is Summit Mountain just over the hill from Marias Pass. So thanks for coming along. There's two main forms of anxiety and they take place in different parts of the brain. So the first type is that survival stuff like the fight or flight mechanism that we've all heard of before. Although these days it's more often referred to as fight, flight, freeze. And that's very useful because that helps us to stay alive in a sudden emergency situation. But it's also the same mechanism that causes panic attacks, which can be very disabling if left untreated. Now that type of anxiety takes place in the amygdala, which is a tiny little structure right in the middle of the brain at the top of the brain stem. And there is a very powerful technique to manage that through a type of deep breathing and meditation. Unfortunately, there's just way too much to talk about in one video, so I plan to make a second video after this one that explains all about how to use deep breathing and meditation to manage anxiety and I'll also talk a lot about why it's useful in terms of managing the chemistry and rewiring of the brain. So if this topic interests you, please subscribe and hit that bell notification so that you are alerted when the next video comes out. For now, I'd like to talk mainly about the second form of anxiety, which shows up mainly as excessive worry. You know how it is when you get some issue stuck in your brain and you just can't stop thinking about it, maybe even to the point of losing sleep, ruminating over the same issue over and over again. Now, this type of anxiety actually takes place more in the temporal lobes of the brain, and I'm going to talk about some basic concepts to help understand that and teach you my simple two-step method for letting go of worry. I thought this type of anxiety might be more pertinent to talk about for backpacking since usually it's some worry or fear about what might happen that gets in the way of people's experience and enjoyment of backpacking. Also, with the pandemic and protests and the economic downturn, all the things that are going on in the world now, we have plenty of things to worry about in the future. So I thought it might be especially helpful for me to talk about this early spring runoff and I'm encountering more and more snow patches as I climb an elevation. I've run into a patch of snow that looks like it isn't going to be short so I decided to finally break out the micro spikes and uh, as long as I'm carrying them I might as well be using them. Given the time of year and elevation I knew it was likely that I would encounter snow. But rather than fearing that obstacle by overestimating the danger and staying at home, I planned ahead by taking the action step of packing microspikes and reassured myself that I could always turn back if it got too dangerous. I just made it around Calf Robe Mountain, which is that, and 
I believe that Firebrand Pass is probably right in there. The question is, I don't know where Lena Lake is. That's my potential ultimate destination. It's been said that this type of worry is usually caused by a mistaken belief, which is overestimation of one of two things either the severity of something happening or the likelihood of something happening. Now, fortunately in our world, those things usually balance out. So if something is, is very severe, it's also very unlikely to happen. And vice versa, if something is very likely to happen, it's also not very severe. So for an example, I might be afraid of being mauled to death by a bear. Well, since I hike in and around Glacier National Park, where there is one of the highest concentrations of grizzly bears in the lower 48 states, that might seem like a very dangerous activity. However, if you look at the statistics, in the 110 year history of Glacier National Park, there have only been 10 fatalities due to encounters with grizzly bears, and only three of those were actually hikers. So if you think about the annual visitation of Glacier Park, which is somewhere in the two to three million people range, that's actually extremely unlikely that I'm going to be mauled by a bear. But if I overestimate the likelihood of that happening, that's what creates anxiety. On the other hand, if I take another situation like being cold at night, then that is maybe something that either keeps me from going backpacking or I overpack for that. There's a saying in ultralight backpacking, which is don't pack your fears. So I might be thinking that that would be a very severe situation because I am afraid that if I was cold, maybe I would actually freeze to death from that. So I would be overestimating the severity of that situation happening. Uh, certainly it is a fairly likely situation because sometimes we don't guess right about what the conditions are going to be. But if I was cold at night, that wouldn't be a life-threatening situation in almost every circumstance. I, there's things I could do like do some sit-ups or push-ups in the tent, or I could get up and heat some water and drink some hot water, or worst case scenario, I could pack up and hike out. So there are things that I could do to address that circumstance and it wouldn't likely be a lethal situation. So if you find yourself anxious and doing a lot of worrying, a good thing to do is to take a step back and ask yourself, am I overestimating one of these two things? Am I guessing that the severity of the situation is much higher than it really is? Or am I overestimating the likelihood of the situation? And we can take that just a little bit further and ask yourself, so what if the worst case scenario happened? Then what? That's a great question to ask, because then what is something we often don't push up against. We only fear that worst case scenario and we don't actually walk through, then what would I do? And a lot of times you might find that even though it's uh, scary and something to be avoided, the truth is that even the worst case scenario, like I just said with getting so cold that I had to pack up and leave, there is something I can do about that and it wouldn't be the end of the world. Well, I've never managed to break a trekking pole before now, but moving along this steep side slope on the snow, I managed to do that. I stuck the pole in and then slipped sideways and just snapped right off. A broken pole was certainly an unexpected event, and it might have been tempting to give up and turn around at that point, especially since I was considering spending the night somewhere and my shelter is held up by the poles, making this an equipment failure on two levels. Resisting, overestimating the severity of the situation allows our brains to function instead of panicking and to come up with action steps. So in this example, first, pushing the lower section of the pole back in where it broke off, which meant losing only about five inches of height, and second, recognizing the possibility of pitching the shelter close to the ground, and that would just protect me more from the wind. Having reasoned through that, I decided to press on 
rather than getting twisted up with what-if scenarios. By the way, overcoming fear doesn't mean rushing blindly into every new situation and ignoring wisdom and caution. I was really looking forward to getting to the top of this pass and seeing the other side, but the circumstances were too dangerous to risk that. In this case, both the severity and the likelihood of the bad thing happening were high, and neither was being overestimated. So I decided to let go of that goal, and I'll come back another time after the snow has melted. Heading out cross country now to try to find my way to Lena Lake. I think it's just over that ridge. So why bother facing our fears? Wouldn't it be easier to just stay home and not do all this effort? Unfortunately, it doesn't work out like that. If you give in to fear, you just find something else to worry about and end up living a closed down, shut in half life. It's only by confronting and overcoming fear that we get to experience the fullness of life and the joy of discovering new things. And there it is. First view of Lena Lake. A lot of snow around, but it's not frozen. Well, I'm on my way back down and I found a nice quiet spot for me to sit out of the wind and tell you about the two-step process of letting go of worry. So the first step is actually giving ourselves permission to actually let go. And that might sound a little weird. Of course, I want to stop worrying, but we all seem to have this subconscious belief. It's almost magical thinking that somehow worrying about the bad thing somehow prevents the bad thing from happening. Uh, there is, of course, no connection whatsoever. And there's an old saying that worry is an attempt to control the uncontrollable. You can maybe feel this if you flip it around and think about what if I let go of worrying about that situation? What would be the danger of that? And sometimes that can bring up the feeling of that I wouldn't be prepared when the bad thing happened. If some emergency occurred and I hadn't worried about it ahead of time, then what? Well, if you think about times in your life, there probably have been many emergency situations that you already have responded to and done very well with. So we don't actually need to be prepared by worrying about stuff. Worrying doesn't actually prepare us for the bad thing. And so worrying really is just like walking through life with your guard up all the time and it gets in the way of experiencing life. Now, it is important to note that worry does serve a useful purpose in the beginning. So if I'm thinking about a certain situation, like maybe I have a job interview in the morning, and I'm thinking that through what might they ask me and what would be some good answers, and maybe even rehearsing that, that's when worry is useful. And sometimes it's a good idea if you're thinking about a huge project, like applying for college or planning a through hike or something like that, there's a lot of steps involved. And so make use of the worry by making a list of the action steps that you can come up with. So for example, if I'm up laying in bed in the middle of the night and I am thinking about a situation might as well just turn on the light and write down those steps that I'm thinking of because then my brain says it's written down, it's okay for me to let go of it and stop thinking about it. So write down all the steps that you can think of that are in your power to do and anything else is not in your power. And so that's where it gets to be wasted energy because we're just spinning around on the same material over and over and not coming up with any new action steps. So just to review, we need to give ourselves permission by, by recognizing that there is no connection between worrying and the bad thing happening. Second, that I have uh, dealt with other emergency situations in my life and been just fine with it, even though I didn't expect those things. And third is making a list of the action steps that you come up with during that first part of worry. The second step is actually letting go. Now, obviously, it doesn't work very well to just tell myself, 
stop worrying, right? That's like saying stop thinking about pink elephants. But what does work is if I've given myself permission to stop focusing on the worry, then I can shift my focus to something else. And it needs to be something that fully engrosses my whole concentration. So maybe a good book or a really engrossing movie, a project that I'm working on that I'm really into, a conversation with a good friend, something like that that will really take all of my brain power and devote it to focusing on the other thing so I don't have anything left over to devote to worry. Now, that works most of the time, but what if you're laying in bed, right? Sometimes you might want to get up and do something, work on a project, but we all have to sleep. So another thing to do that you can alternatively shift your focus to is the deep breathing and meditation technique that I'm going to talk about in the next video. So make sure you hit that subscribe button and do the bell notifications so that you don't miss out on that next video that talks about how you can make use of meditation to shift your focus away from the worry. All right, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.